All right, welcome to today's episode of Tomorrow's Leader, where we dive deep on all things leader-related, related to leading yourself and, of course, leading others. I'm your host, John Larito, and I am extremely excited about this episode today. We have a guest on here that I have been thinking about having on the show for so long, and we just made this happen. Uh, this is Mo Taylor, who is one of my favorite people. I've gotten a chance to know him over the last few years as uh, being in my opinion, the single best coach my son has ever had. Uh, my son has been obsessed with basketball for a good portion of his life. And uh, for those of you who are athletes out there, you know the difference a coach makes. And wow, this guy is the cream of the crop. So Mo, welcome to the show. Hey, John, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. Looking forward to it. You got it, man. I'm looking forward to talking all kinds of stuff um, and, and getting into leadership and how you lead teams and all that kind of stuff, because you do such a great job of it. But uh, why don't we start just with your story? I'd love to take kind of take it back to how you got to where you are right now. And for the audience that most of which doesn't know you like I do, I think it'd be <laughs> helpful for them to uh, to hear your story. So why don't you start off with your story? Well, I'm, I'm Mo Taylor. I'm from... Uh... Philadelphia originally, Westchester, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I came up here when I was younger. Uh, loved the game of basketball. I was terrible at it at first. Uh, and through time and effort and really good coaches, uh, really good people around me, uh, I developed a skill and I used it ultimately to play in college. I went to Wentworth, got a, had a very good career there, um, had some beautiful children, uh, and they wanted me to coach them at one point. We took them to a program. Uh, that we thought would be a good program for them. Uh, and they came back to me and said, we're not learning anything. I don't know what I'm going to be doing here. What do I do, daddy? So they said, can you got, can you coach me? And as a dad, you're like, yeah, I don't know if that's a good idea. <laughs> I don't really know if that's a good idea. Um, but I did it. Uh, it was a lot of learning curves, a lot of improvement areas I had to make. Uh, one of the main things I knew as a leader uh, is you have to understand the service. A lot of people don't understand that. Like when they see leader, they, they assume the guy is somebody barking orders, telling you what to do all the time. Um, but also being able to listen was one of the things I had to learn uh, as a leader because you don't, you don't realize you have, a lot, you have a lot of experiences, but you have to meet people where they're at. And that was a hard thing for me to do because you, you say, well, I want you to be here, I want you to be here, but they're not there yet. So what do you do with those people who aren't there yet? Um, and I use that as a transition from not just basketball, but life, because as a product manager is what I do in my other, in my other side, my other side job. Um, as a product manager, you have to lead people as well and guide them and follow, follow the, a train of thought that everybody wants to be on the same page. But again, you may have an understanding of what you want to do, but where are they at? Can you get them to where you want them to be and put push them through those, those difficult challenges when they're like, okay, well, you know, <laughs> I see what you're saying, but they have every excuse not to do it the way you need them to do it. Mm -hmm. So as a leader, you have to find them where they're at and then lift them up and push them um, through that uncomfortable experience. So listening in is, is a big skill that you need, that you, you feel that you've developed. Did you always have that or did you have to develop it? Um, you, I would say it had to be developed yeah. because you, you, you're listening, but sometimes also being empathetic, like empathetically listening and then understanding Okay, I hear what you're. I hear what you're saying, but this is what we still have to get done. Mm -hmm. So when you, point, yeah, yeah. So Go now, ahead. when when you started coaching, which that's kind of a cool way to get into it, your kids asked you to do it. Um, <laughs> were you? I mean, how did you feel about it? Were you good at it? Did you like it at first? Was it tough? Technically, from a technical standpoint, I was excellent. I was the technical stuff, but it's more than just the X's and O's and you know conditioning and training. It's now about leading people and a lot of times people don't understand that when they say when you say leading people you got to give them something to follow like what are, what are they going to follow you're just going to tell them to do do x y and z but why should they do that and then you have to like you have to have a, a standard of credibility um so i i learned quickly that i was deficient in a lot of different areas so what i did is i literally built relationships with the coaches in the area um i would go to each college call them up and say hey coach it's okay if i come in and just pick your brain about things that you're looking for things that you expect kids to be able to do by the time they get to you. Mm -hmm. And I would go and watch their practices. I would go and listen to them. I would interview them. Um, and they were very, they were very receptive to it. And it was, it was helpful. I built a lot of good relationships through it. That's interesting. So how, and how, how much did you learn through that? Was that, is that a big part of your coaching and your leadership style is what you learned from other people? 
Uh, absolutely. I mean, this the coach needs to be coached sometimes too. You're always learning. This is not a, uh, I know everything. I, I learned everything and I don't need to learn anything anymore. You are constantly learning. People are constantly changing. The dynamics, as you see every year, there's something that you need to learn. You need to know better. Yeah. Um, and if you're not, if you're not on top of it, you'll lose, you'll lose sight of what's going on. And then you'll lose perspective of how to reach kids. Yeah. Do you think most people know that? Like, do, do most people realize that, okay, you, you've got to, even as good, the better you get, that you you still need coaching, and maybe it's a different type of coaching. Do you think most people understand that, or most people don't? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I look I look out at some of the the coaches that I see going on now, and some do, and some don't. So it's like it's how much do like what are you really doing it for, and what's your why? Why am I doing this? So when I when I took this on, I, I said there were three things I want to be able to do. I want to be able to get kids into school. I want to take those kids that weren't that weren't able to get the attention maybe on their varsity or JV or whatever team they were on. Uh, somebody didn't believe in them. And you just need one person to believe in you say, hey, look, you can do it. I believe in what you're going to, you can do. And then you push them, like you push them beyond that comfort level. Uh, and I think that's the challenge all the times. Can you, can you do that and still keep them engaged and still keep them willing to, willing to try? Like, mm -hmm. right? cause that's, as a coach, you got, it's just a fine line. You can either push them to a point of breaking you can push them to a point of greatness. So that's that's the line that you have to learn how to do. So that's one of the things I just, I, I admire about you so much. I mean, you've got this great balance between the people side and the empathetic side. This is at least what I observed, the relationship side. But man, you were tough. I mean, you were tough on these guys. When Nick was playing with you, it was like, you know, <laughs> it was, there were times where it was like, you know, yeah, you, 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 you push these guys significantly outside their comfort zone. And you know what? It, it worked, but how do you know where that line is? Like, how do you know when you've pushed somebody too far or you, they need to be pushed more? Well, I mean, if they're like, so, you know, you've pushed too far. If they just shut down, if they shut down, it's too far. So like, they're, they're going to, they're going to tell you, they're going to show you whether they're like, if it's too much. Um, and that's where you have to back off, take your foot off the pedal and say, okay, let's, let's take a step back and let's, let's, let's take some baby steps through this. Yeah. And then like, you have to engage with them. You have to like, again, the listening aspect, you have to listen and listen to what they're telling you. Mm -hmm. What is and when they're not yeah. when they're not responding? That they're telling you something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and everybody's different. I mean, some people some people like that really, uh, you know, kind of an in-your-face style of leadership. Some people really re thrive with that. Other people, uh, they they just they do they shut down. So, are you are you looking for a certain type of person when you're building a team? Are you looking for somebody that really does respond well, or are you just are you looking for talent and then adapting your leadership style to the the players that you have? I'm looking for character first. Cause I mean, if you don't, they don't have any character and they're difficult um, in that area, if that's not something that they have. It's going to be very difficult to do anything else because it, at the end of the day, um, your talent can only take you so far. If you're just, an, if you're in a horrible individual, nobody's going to want to work with you anyway. That's <laughs> not anything. So mm -hmm. I think I'm looking at character first. Then I look at, you know, do you really want it? The, your willingness to show up, like to be engaged all every day, all the time. Uh, and then lastly, your talent. I mean, your talent, can, I, anybody can teach. I can teach you how to shoot a jump shot. Uh, it's a lot more difficult to teach you how to be a good person. So tell me, let's talk a little bit more about the character piece. How do you, what do you look for? What are the things, what are examples of what you're talking about and why that makes such a big difference? Well, I mean, I'll use your son, Nick, for example. I mean, your son, when he came to me, um, he, another coach called me on behalf of him. Uh, Terrell, a good friend of mine, he said, hey, look, I got this kid, Nick, Laredo, Mo, he needs your help. Uh, he's a really good kid. He wants to get better. And he always showed up. He was the first one in the gym, last one out. You ask, he, you ask him to run through a wall, he's running through the wall. Um, but he's also engaged. It wasn't like he, it was just me always talking at him. He would come to me and say, hey, coach, I didn't understand what you meant. What do you mean by that? Could you walk me through? So when you have, when you have a player like that, that's when you have that back and forth and they feel comfortable enough to have that conversation, I think that's it's easier it's easier to to, to coach coach them. Mm -hmm. um, but when you have those kids are just like, oh, this is too hard. They're whining, and complaining. It creates an energy in a culture that you don't want to you don't want to have. Mm -hmm. So I try to nip that stuff in the bud immediately. So I push them really hard to see where they're at. Yeah. Because if I push you through something, if I put you in an uncomfortable situation and you quit, I know what you are now. Yeah. So if I push you in an uncomfortable situation, you go, hey, let's let's we can do this. Let's go together. Yeah. And that's sort of where your son was at. 
So how, how do you handle that? So you got a lot of leaders that are listening that might be dealing whether they're a coach of a team or a CEO of a company or a teacher or whatever, that they're dealing with a team and, or an organization where they've got you know one or two people that are, like you said, they may be having a negative impact on other people or the character's not there. They're, how do you deal with them, that type of person, when they're already on the team? And it's not a matter of selecting them to be on there, but you already got them. So, I mean, that's – sometimes it's an unfortunate reality. Sometimes you let people go. Um, but other times I think you give everybody a chance to see – like, because obviously they feel, they, they feel a certain way because for a certain reason. Maybe you came in after a, a certain leader was a certain way uh, and your style is different from what they were, they were, their style was. So you want to sit them down and just, hey, walk through them. Hey, like, you know, I noticed there's a couple areas that we're struggling in. Could you walk me through, like, is there something that I'm doing that you're not understanding? Um, is there something I need to do better? So you, you, you kind of take the ownership as a leader, you take the ownership of it and see how they respond to it. Um, but if you, after you have that conversation, if there's still that, that tension and they're still not getting things done and producing, you have to have that uncomfortable conversation sometimes. Yeah. So, so how do, you know, one of the things I, I, I loved about you too, it wasn't like, you know, if the guys were playing like crap, I mean, it was easy to be, it's come down on somebody <laughs> and be really tough, but man, there were times where these guys kicked ass i mean they, they yep. might have won by 20 points or 30 points and i remember i think there was a game where you had them because they didn't play to the level and i'd love to get your perspective on it this was my take because they didn't you, you knew they didn't play to the level that they could uh you had them like running you had them doing drills after the game i don't know if you remember that maybe it was yeah, more than once but i remember it vividly <laughs> and it was like wait a second these guys won by like 30 points and you're like you know you're just <laughs> you had them you know running and stuff Talk about that. What's your philosophy on that? Because it's a mindset. I mean, once you, just because you're better, like you're supposed to do certain things against certain teams. Like if you're if you're better than somebody else in some a certain area, yes, you should you should you should win. But there is a certain style in which you you do win. So what what I'm what when I saw them playing down to competition, in a sense, they weren't really they weren't sharing the basketball. They're going one on one. They were outside of they were outside of our our general um, uh, general purpose and how and how we do things and I'm like that's not what we do here. So when they're showboating and you're like you just kind of rubbed it in their other team's face. I don't like I don't like stuff like that. Or when you're just taking shots that you're never going to shoot in re like reality. You're not. Gonna, I'm never going to shoot that. And you're taking those shots. That tells me that you're not you're not you're not focused. You're not engaged. And you're not conducting yourself in a manner like I'm never looking down. I'm looking up. So if you're doing that against those guys, then why aren't you doing that against the guys that are better than you? Mm. Like, that's how I look at it. Yeah. Like, if you're going to do that there, do it there. Like, yeah. what, you have all this confidence here against these guys. Where's the confidence go when you have to challenge somebody who's just like you or a little bit better than you? Yeah. And that's, and that's, and that's the struggle with a lot of kids. They see all this highlight stuff. They want, to, they want the fanfare of it, but they don't like a lot of the work that goes with it. Yeah. Well, I, I love that, you know, and I think I see a lot of leaders that they're they're lowering their standards or allowing the standards of the organization to drop because they rationalize that, OK, there's some kind of success. Maybe the organization, you know, maybe it is a sports team and they won, but they still didn't play to the standards that they should. Or it's an organization that maybe they're growing by five to 10 percent a year. They've had an up year. And because of that, they're letting their standards the complacent the complacency the complacency complacent. Just creeps in exactly so. they're not pushing themselves so what what does that look like i mean to to a leader that might be listening to this being like you know what you know that's that's right that's me i've kind of i've kind of become complacent how do they what would be your advice how do they they turn that around and kind of change that mindset in their organization i i would say constantly learning i mean challenge yourself have those uncomfortable conversations ask people how is my leadership? What can I be doing better? A lot of times people don't ask those questions. They don't ask, what am I doing wrong? Like, what can I do better? Where are my, where are my gaps in my, in my, in my leadership? Because once you ask those questions, <laughs> you may not like the, you may not like the responses, <laughs> but you have to ask those questions and that's how you get better. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I usually say, ask the people who know you the best. They'll tell you the truth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they'll tell you the truth immediately. <laughs> So let me ask you, I know I'm going all over the place because I got so many questions fine, I want to ask fine. you about. So you've coached so much um, and, and you've obviously had, you know, great seasons, great games, great teams, great players. You've had some bad and every coach goes through that. 
Are there times where you feel like, because I think a leader, this is really helpful for all leaders. Are there times where maybe you feel like, okay, you weren't at your A game uh, and maybe made bad decisions or whatever that might have impacted the game or the result and you feel like it was partly on you? Or do you feel like, you know, that doesn't happen too much? <laughs> it's okay. Well, I, I always feel like it's, it's, it's always on me. That's just the reality situation. Good, bad, or indifferent, it's always on me. Um, I, people came, they came to, to the program um, because they wanted excellence. And if I'm not delivering that, if I'm having an off day, it's unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. You guys came here for a certain reason to do something a certain way. So I need to be consistent. I need to be um, purposeful in what, everything that I say and challenge the kids with. And I have to be prepared. Like, I mean, if I'm, if I'm going out there and I'm not prepared, my, my, like, so we had, a, we had a game. We first started to fall back up. Uh, I'll tell you this one story. Uh, and my kids were all there. My, my older two up that were playing overseas. They're here and they're watching the game. And, they, and we're after the game, we lost bad. We were up by 20, lost by 15. It was a bad loss. So they, they were all sitting in the, in the pizza shop, and or I go, so what do you think of the game? He's like, you don't really want to know. And I go, what do you think of the game? And he says to me, that's the worst coach I've ever seen. I go, that's not who you are. And he go, I go, what do you mean? He goes, you were doing more yelling than, uh, than coaching. And I said, well, how do, you, how do you figure that? He says, they go, where was the teaching? Like, you, you lost sight of what you were teaching. And I said, you're right. So now, again, this is what I'm saying. Like, you have to take those uncomfortable conversations and you have to turn them into something. So I could I could have let it fold up there. I could, I said, we have to get better. So I took it as a challenge to coach more. Like, in, in game coaching, I have to understand, like, all these kids don't come from the same background that we came from. I got, I was spoiled because I had kids that knew that, like, they would have been with me for a while. They could play at a certain level. I knew what I was getting from them. I could just... I could just, you know, go through the motions kind of like um, we're on cruise control. Yeah. Again, that complacency thing, Creep said. Yeah. So you get complacent and you forget that you still have to coach everywhere. And that was one of my challenges to um, correct wow. this year. That's awesome. That's great. And there's a few takeaways I get from that. One is I, you probably wouldn't have gotten that feedback had you not asked for it and prompted it, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, you know, it's tough feedback for somebody to give to somebody, but, you know, kudos to him to give it to you, but more so to you to ask for it. So I think that's one of my takeaways is, you know, a lot of leaders are not asking for feedback enough. Hey, what'd you think? You know, whatever. I ran that meeting. How was the meeting? Was it effective? Did you leave there better than, than you came <laughs> in? Um, or was it a waste of time? You know, there are people that'll be honest with you. You just need to solicit that feedback sometimes. Um, but the second thing that makes me think about is the, the, just the whole emotions. I mean, you know, it's hard to not get emotional when you're watching a game and uh, whether you're a spectator or player or coach, how does that play into it? I mean, that there, that might've been a situation where emotions cause you to, to yell and, and be angry and not coach or teach as much. What's your take on that? Like, how do you, how do you, how important is it to pull out the emotions or do the emotions actually help you lead better? Do you think? Well, depending on what it is, I think there's a time to, you have to, again, this is knowing your, knowing your players. You also have like, if you're, if I'm an employer or I'm leading the team, I need to know my people. I need to know the cadence that they go by, like how, what's going to motivate them and, and, and push them um, to success. And I, I think you have to, you have to read, it's a read. Uh, you have to know when to do that. You have to know when not to do that. Um, I thought, you know, it was, what I did wasn't effective. We lost by 15 in, in a game where we were winning by 20. So you have to recognize, okay, that was not an effective use of that emotion. Mm -hmm. So you have to be aware of it. I say, I, I, I can't, you can't play a sport and not have any emotions as possible. Um, you can't have, um, you can't do anything without any energy. So I think it is necessary to read the situation and then navigate it. And if, when they need those moments where you gotta, you gotta rah, 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 you do with it. And if you need those moments, we got to chew on somebody's leg and you do it. Um, but again, you have to read the situation and know the people that you're with, like how to, how to motivate them. Hmm. That's great. I like that. A lot of, a lot of leaders, I know qu questions I get a lot are around just, I think a lot of leaders get, get very caught up with, um, and I'm interested in your take on this, of, of what people think uh, and, and what they think of them, meaning as the leader, um, and what they think of their decisions and everything. How much do you think a leader should be concerned or should they not be concerned 
with what other people think. Well, I mean, to a certain degree, obviously, if they're this a stakeholder in, in what you're doing or client, you, you literally you, you have to listen to what their you know their perspective is. But again, there are you, you need to know what your vision is. If you don't have a vision, then you can be swayed any which way from Sunday. But if you have a vision and you're saying, is this is this in in line with what the vision of what I'm trying to do is, or is this deviating from that that vision? So again, you can listen to it. And they, like as a leader, you have to put it, okay, is this necessary or is it not? So that's 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 your decision making power. Mm -hmm. But again, if it's a stakeholder and they, they want something a certain way and you're trying to deliver something to them, then obviously you have to take into perspective. But again, if it's not a legal way to do something or you know, engineering wise, it's not gonna be a solid uh, firm thing to do, then obviously you can't do that. It's gonna be a health risk or something like that. No, don't do it. Yeah. But I think you need to have your vision you need to be clear about what that vision is, communicate it, articulate it, and then execute it. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I look at. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I respect the fact that you were not, you stuck to your beliefs and your principles and your way of coaching and leading. Uh, even at times where, you know, people, I mean, you, you were not afraid to call people out, not only players, but there were some times where I think parents almost uh, were not, uh, we're, we're going against the philosophy or, or the principles of your team. Uh, I, you know, I remember one situation, one parent pulling them out in the middle of the tournament and uh, because they whatever, and it wasn't really a good reason you called them out in the middle of it. I mean, in the group and it was, it was needed. It had to happen and it should. And I think everybody felt a sense of pride after you did that uh, because, Hey, we've got high standards and we're protecting these. Uh, so I, I, I admire that when I see a lot of leaders that, that are, uh, they're, they're too, e uh, it's too easy for them to, to drop those standards when they're challenged on them, when they have outside influences that are kind of, you know, tugging, whether it's people in their organization or outside of their organization that are kind of trying to lead them in a different direction. But you're a guy that sticks by that and just, Hey, put the stake in the ground. Here's who we are. And here's what we're going to do. Um, uh, is that how, do, do you, what's your thought on that? I mean, is that, is that how you feel? Well, I, I mean, we have, we have, we kind of have to have, I kind of have this conversation every year and there are three things that I tell everybody that we're, that we're going to want to live by. I said, my, my role as a director and as a um, coach leader and for my program and my vision for my program is there are three things that we follow. We go program first. Is it in the best interest of what the program needs to do? Uh, then it goes team. Uh, are these things that we're doing? And constructive and going to be productive for our team and then lastly what are the individual things i need to make sure are getting done for each player and each member of the team so it's in that order it doesn't deviate mm -hmm. so if, if they don't like that if they want to do the reverse and they say i want to be and then i want i need to get all my stuff done first and then i'll figure out what the program needs and i'll figure out what the team needs it's not going to be a good fit yeah that's and good. so like and that. so that's why that's what that's where I stand by. <laughs> yeah. OK, I like that. So so uh, another great uh, a question I think I get a lot of times. Uh, there's a lot of leaders that don't necessarily know how to lead a players, their best people. And I see a lot of leaders and you can almost read their mind. You can see what's happening. And I, I, you know, candidly, I've been in this situation sometimes in leading organizations. You've got some people that are really they're top shelf. They're really, really good. They're very talented. And they're almost the type of people, listen, whether you're there or not, they are going to figure out how to succeed and be great. <laughs> and I see a lot of leaders that don't know how to lead that person. So what they do is they they don't lead them. They just pull back. Uh, and they they just, as they describe it or rationalize it, hey, I'm just going to, the best thing I can do for this person is stay out of their way. Um What's your philosophy? You know, how do you lead those top people, that A player, and what does it look like? I mean, those you still have to have those conversations. So if you're leading an A player, they're the standard now. They're kind of like what you're like, but is it in line with what you again your vision? Is it in line with the standards of what you're doing and what you're trying to do? So each year you have whatever goals you set prior to those goals, but it, is what you're doing? Are we, if we're saying we're going to go work in the, we're gonna go out the whole hotel industry. We're going hard at the hotel industry. We're gonna sell, sell, sell to them. And then you go out and you go to a pharmaceutical company. Is that, yeah, you did, you got the job, but is that what we're trying to do? What is the vision that we're trying to build for our company and our brand? Mm -hmm. So again, even though you're a top performer and you're doing great things, is it in line with what we're trying to do? Mm -hmm. 
So again, at the end of the day, they can't be devoid of what we're doing. You have to be in line with it. And if it's not in line, it's a separation, it's a deviation. So now you're gonna, at some point, it's gonna be a problem. Mm -hmm. So if you leave the company and you have that, that client that now we're in service and we don't have a person to fill it, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So that's how, that's how I look at it. So at the end of the day, yeah, you can, you can, you can let them do their own thing, but it's not in line with what the, the program is. Yeah. You have to tell them, you have to tell them, hey, look, this is what we're doing. I love, I love, you can still say, hey, look, I love what you're doing. I love, I love the ingenuity of it. But did you think about all these factors after? Because a lot of times people just do stuff and they're not thinking about how does it affect the other people that are involved now. Mm. Yeah. And that's how you do it. <laughs> Great point. Yeah. We sometimes have blind spots and we don't see that stuff. And even the best players, the best people, top talented uh, leaders and, and uh, people in any organization, they're not always going to see the, they have the perspective that the leader has. So sometimes just that outside influence, outside perspective is incredibly valuable. You know, I also think about just the fact that, you know, there's, there's a there's a lot of people that ultimately uh, you know I look at a runner I mean if a if a if a if a top elite runner is running a race um, and they're running against you know high school athletes okay you know they, they might <laughs> crush it but that's still not if they're capable of running a six minute mile and they're running a seven and a half and that's enough to to beat you know their their competitors. They're not being led to really become the best version of themselves. So if they've got the capability to run a six-minute mile uh, pace, then that coach or that leader's responsibility ultimately is to help them get to that potential. So I think a lot of leaders are kind of scratching their head. They're like, well, I don't know. When, how do you know when somebody has the potential to really be top-notch? I mean, how do you know when somebody's got the potential to you know, make it to the NBA? You know, and how do you keep pushing them and pushing them or know, you know, or, or know when, hey, maybe they don't have the potential. What's your thought on, on how you actually size up someone's potential? That's a tough, that's a tough one. It's a good question. Uh, that ultimately does a lot of conversations of experience, I would say. Um, it's, it's all a gamble anyway. I mean, you're, you're really looking at it because you're, you're saying if all things align, stars align, nothing happens um, and you're going to play at an elite level or be at an elite level. Uh, you need to have no injuries. Um, there needs to be like, you want to go to a certain school or do a certain thing. How do you compare to those kids that they recruit? Like, what do you look like? Do you look, do you, are you similar to in size and skill to those players? Uh, do you have the mindset to, to withstand all the stuff that you're going to be hit with? I mean, there's a lot of, like a lot of people just don't understand the scholarship level. It's business. It's a big business. And a lot of people think that they're walking in like, yeah, the fanfare, but I'm I play for Duke. I play for Arizona. It's the best place in the world. Great. But it's a business and you're there for a job. They're not giving you $250,000, $300,000, all the sneakers and uniforms and all the fun, fancy stuff. Yeah, that's great. But there's a lot of work that goes before that. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're not, if you're not comparable to play at those levels, to be at those levels, you don't look like what they usually, they bring in or do. You need to ask yourself: Is this a realistic? Is this a realistic goal? Um, but as far as potential, that's that's some of the that's some of the coach and that's some of the person. Mm -hmm. yeah. So again, how much are you really good willing to put in? Because there's going to be a lot of roadblocks. The universe has a funny way of challenging you. Yeah. So for instance, like like this year, like I wanted to have, I was going to have about six teams, seven teams. And I was like, oh, I have I have all these grandiose goals. And then the universe says, okay, we're just going to throw a pandemic in the middle of all this. See how bad you really want it. <laughs> <laughs> to see how bad you really want it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, and again, we were, we had opportunity, like we had lost a lot of like really good opportunities to play in some really high level tournaments. Like, what do you do in those moments? The challenge now is do I push the forward through all that stuff or do I let it, do I let it, do I let it be a roadblock and stop me from doing what I want to do? So what we call, what we invented, what we implemented this year is we just call it a pivot. So this is the year of the pivot, the pandemic pivot. So if something happens, we're just going to pivot and do something else. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't play in some tournaments. Okay, we'll pivot. We'll make our own tournaments. I mean, mm -hmm. it forces you out of an account again, out of that comfort level. Um, I I wasn't I wasn't standardly doing my own tournaments. I started doing my own stuff. So in, in an effort because we couldn't leave the state. <laughs> so you now we couldn't play in all the tournaments that they had here. They weren't we weren't allowed to. So I said we create our own little we create our own little bubble and we'll play as many teams as we can play in our own bubble. Mm -hmm. 
That makes I love that man. The pivot. I mean, the pandemic pivot. <laughs> and wow, I mean, you think about it. All everybody, everybody has been affected in one way or the other. Yep. Their life has changed. It's just a matter of in what areas and how much. I mean, but everybody's you know their way of working, running their business, uh, their way of everything from you know sports and health and athletics to relationships to finances to everything has has changed. So it's the people, and I know, and you probably do as well, the people that I talk to that are doing well, there's a lot of people I talk to that say, you know what, 2020 is the best year I've ever had. Granted, it's a horrible thing that's happened, but it's pushed me out of my comfort zone and out of my norm so that now I've, I've done different things that I definitely wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have done before. Other people have been paralyzed, you know, and they, they're now that's another word, yeah. paying yeah. a price. So, right, the two P words, paralyzed or pivot. Um, so do you find that, though? Have, have, do you find the people, and sometimes you pivot and you, make a, you pivot the wrong way, uh, is, how important is it just to realize that, hey, you know what, it's not about making the right choice or it's just a matter of making some choice. Is it more that and pivoting to something? Uh, or is it, because I see a lot of people kind of overthinking, like, okay, well, what do I do? I don't know what to do. What is the right answer? What's your thought on that? You just got to make a decision. I, I'm, I'm at the point. I was at the point where, okay, I, this is what we're, this is what we're challenged with, and this is how we're gonna. This is you just put the energy into it and say, this is what we're doing. You don't ask a question. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of you make a statement. A lot of times in the games, guys will be like, who got him? If you're asking a question, that should be a statement. I got the ball. Go cover somebody else. Which is, the, <laughs> which is, <laughs> which is often in life too. People will say, well, who's doing what? No, you're doing this. If you recognize something or a deficiency, you should say, I got this, but I need support here. Mm-hmm. And I think when you take that approach, you say, I'm going to take, take the lead in it. And if right, wrong, or indifferent, I'm going to make a decision. And I need you guys to back it. And we, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna plan around it, whatever we're going to do. But that's the direction we're going. I love so, it, man. Yeah, that might make be. A statement. That's the golden nugget, man. I love that. That's such a great <laughs> piece of advice. Just listen, I got it. I'm going to take it. Here's the support I need. I think that's fantastic. Too many people sitting on the sidelines waiting for somebody else to take charge or make that decision or grab the ball, whatever. Uh, I love that. That's awesome. I mean, this is the year of survival. Like, the other basketball analogy, survive in advance. I mean, that's this. If you survive through this, 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 this mess of a year, uh, I mean, yeah. that's, that's great. But you want to advance now. Like, what is the next steps now? What are my next steps? What do I, what do I, what are my takeaways? What I learn? What did I not? What was I not prepared for that I need to be prepared for in case this ever happens again? Yeah, or something similar to it. So you know what? And and sometimes you have to. You know, I'm I'm wired like you, where it's like you know I want to. I'm constantly trying to succeed, and it's about accomplishment and advancement and this and that. But sometimes you got to realize, listen, the goal is just weather the storm. I mean, there's a <laughs> lot of people out there that are like you know we've all dealt with really tough times and. Uh, Sometimes it's like that boat in the middle of a storm. I mean, you know, they're yeah. just trying to stay afloat and fight the waves and the craziness. And then once the storm passes, it's nice and calm and serene and sunny out. And sometimes you just got to make it through that. Um, and right. that's, I think, a lot of people's perspective. And that helps just to know, listen, the storm's temporary. It will go away. You know? well, I mean, one of the other things that we, we try to do here is like with Prodigy um, is we, we want to say like, service like you want to be of service to somebody else so while we're going through our things understand somebody else is going through theirs probably even worse than you so i try to make sure i reach out to the parents and the players and see how they're doing um regularly because I, at the end of the day this is it's a, we try to create a community of, of people that care about one another um this is not just basketball i really generally care about all the families that are in the program um i care about the kids and i want to see them i want to see them succeed uh, not as a client, but as a, as people, like these are, these are, I, I call them my extended family, your extended family at this point. I mean, we're going through some serious situations. Uh, you no longer just a friend or a client or a person that, that I know we're actually, we're actually, uh, aligned at the hip to certain things. So oh, I take it, I take it seriously. And I take this service as a this service seriously when I, when I'm working with the kids. Yeah. So well, I, I think I, as a leader, you do that. I've seen that firsthand. Nick f- felt that and saw that firsthand. I mean, there were a lot of, lot of time you spent with him and it, and co- long conversations, and it wasn't necessarily about basketball. Uh, sometimes it was about other stuff, and it was about life. Um, so I, I know he valued that and appreciated that. You and I were talking before about gratitude, and I love, uh, obviously, that's 
so critical, I think, especially now. But talk to, talk to us a little bit about that, your perspective on being grateful. I, I mean, if you're not grateful now, I don't know, and, and you like, you know, I, I knock on wood, I've been, nobody in my family's uh, suffered any serious illness. Um, I have, you know, health and, and, and good fortune around me. I mean, I have really good people. I'm able to do something that I really love and enjoy, uh, which is teach the game of basketball. Uh, and we've we've done it during a time where a lot of people don't can't say that anymore. Like people have lost people that dare to them. Uh, they had uh, a serious illness or they've had debilitating um, financial situation where they, they lost their job, lost their house, maybe even lost a loved one and a, and a, or, or a spouse that they, they had one, at one point. Uh, what, what I say to right now is this, this time reveals really what you are. Like really, really reveals like what, what you're really all about. Like, do you care about just you or do you care about the people around you? Um, and if you can't really care and be empathetic for what's going on around you, I think you, you that's just a heartless situation to live in. And if there's, if you look around, you just have things, <laughs> then that's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem. Yeah. Right now you're quarantined. Like who's around you? Like, is it just my, me and my big old house and all my fancy cars and all my fancy stuff? I don't really have anybody else to, to, to share it with. I mean, cause you can't go anywhere. Yeah. So like, who, who am I sharing my life with? What am I sharing to the world? What, if, if I left today, what is, what is my memory going to be? What is, what are they going to say about me? What, what did I do of any significance? So mm -hmm. I take that to heart every day and I try to be grateful for the opportunities I get, do something with each every day, each and mm -hmm. every day. Well, I, I, I love that perspective. And you just think about, you know, in what you're doing, how many lives you're impacting and, and, in you know, candidly in probably many more ways and more significantly than you even realize. Uh, because I remember, you know, coaches in my career, in my uh, life that, that that had a really significant impact and they didn't realize I've, I've reconnected with a couple of my coaches recently from back in high school I haven't <laughs> talked to them in whatever it is 30 years um, and they had a big impact they taught me about leadership they taught me about life they helped me do things I never would have been able to do and I don't know if they realized it or they did it intentionally but it came from a point of they cared they really truly cared about me not just us winning the game, you know, and that's, I think the big difference. Yeah. And as you get older, like I'm, I'm, I'm still very close with my high school coaches too. Um, they're both, they're both still alive. Gratefully. Um, Francis, uh, Francis McGrail, Frank McGrail and Jim McGrail, who's one of the top lawyers up here. I like he, they, they, they chat, like even today, like they still, they, we still stay in contact and they, they have touched my life in a way that I, I think if I did not have them, um, in high school, I think I probably would have been a, a hot mess. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I also had like, you know, in college at Wentworth, some of the best coaches and best people I've ever met, Harry McShane, uh, Chris Barley, who's at WPI now, uh, Jeff Corrigan, those, those coaches, like they weren't just involved basketball wise. They were involved. Like we would, we did stuff outside of basketball, yeah. which is why we do so much success. They were so, they were so adamant about you being, being something more than what you were. And they didn't have to do that. They really didn't. They were all really, really good coaches. Um, they could have just said, we're going to be, we're going to coach you guys and you guys do it or you don't do it. Yeah. But they were engaged with us outside of like real life stuff. Things were happening. My car broke down a couple of times. They would help me out. Like it was just, it was just crazy. I mean, they did a lot of good things for me, like, for yeah. me as a man to grow. So, and some of them, you know, it's, it becomes part of how you live life, not just play the game. You know, I remember, you know, Joe Pingator, uh, it was my high school, one of my high school baseball coaches. I played baseball and, uh, he just taught us a lot about living life. I mean, I, we would sprint on and off the field. Like, and I was a pitcher. So I would literally, oh. I mean, if I didn't sprint from the mound to the dugout after the inning, I mean, literally, it was like, you don't see that. I mean, it was just this <laughs> mentality. Uh, and we would dive head first into first base. So you'd hit a oh, routine man. ground ball in, in the infield. And it wasn't like you run it out and run through the bag like, you know, every normal baseball player. <laughs> We dove head first into first play, first base. You don't see that. I mean, parents were like, what are you doing? Are you kidding? And we were like, I don't know. Coach told us we're going to dive into first base. But I will tell you, it just had, it bred this mentality of you just play to win. And you just, part of it is, and it, believe me, the other teams were, would be like, oh my God, what these guys, these guys are willing to dive into first base. Like, what are they? These guys are animals. So it was a little bit of the intimidation thing, but wow, it built our confidence and it made us feel like invincible. So I don't know if that was his design or intent, but it was, and it really truly spilled over to a lot of ways that I live life. His sayings, you know, you gotta want it. 
you know, total hustle. You know, these are things that he used to routinely say. So, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that those are shaping moments in your life. Um, and they sometimes, whether you're a coach or a leader in any organization, it might just be a 30 second interaction that you have with somebody that 30 years from now, that 30 second interaction is going to be in their head. They're going to remember it and it will have shaped their life. And I think that's the power that all leaders have. And wow, you know, you, you've, you've done such a great job in using that uh, power and influence to impact people positively. So from, from me to you, thank you, because you had a big impact on myself. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Yeah, you got it. So what else? Um, I, I know we're running short of time. I'd love to talk to you more, but um, I know you're, <laughs> you, 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 I'd love to hear just to have you share a little bit about your outreach program and maybe some things, maybe ways people can get in touch with you and what you're doing, working on right now. So if you ever want to reach me, the first thing I'll give you is go to right to www.prodigybasketball.com. It has all my content information right on there. It has the things that we're working on. Um, we are trying to build their outreach program right now, for the sciences and math programs, uh, tutoring services out of Framingham. Uh, we, so when I first started this, one of the things that uh, I reached out to my, my former boss and he was like, you know, my wife did this for a long time with tenacity. You know, some of the things that you're doing are great, but we really think you need to have an educational portion of what, what you're doing. And I said, that's, you know what, that's exactly right. So he gave me kind of like a, he literally gave me a blueprint on what to do, how to line it up um, and, and, to really, and to really navigate that world. And I said, well, you know, I want to stay in the, on, you know, the sciences and maths. I mean, the STEM stuff is really where everything is, at, is going right now. And I want to kind of keep it in that, in that vein. Uh, and I think a lot of times kids don't, don't really know how much is really involved in that you know, science, you know, math and, and engineering. Like that's that's huge. That's everything that we do. So I want to make sure um, that the kids are getting that that portion. Um, so it's, again, it's still in the infancy stages. They will probably be promoted within the next couple of months. But, you know, keep an eye on www.projectbasketball.com and we will, we will make sure that this is something that is uh, expanded into the community. That's fantastic. Well, we'll put all that in the show notes also so people can uh, have the link down there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's tremendous. That's, uh, that's a uh, fantastic way to even provide even more of an impact. So thank you. Uh, we, have, we have really good coaches for the Prodigy Basketball. What, like, again, we stand by making sure that you are getting what you need and we meet people where they're at. You know, we try to make sure that they're getting development. We coach you hard. Uh, we and we really, we really, really, really care about the kids and the families that are with us. Mm -hmm. Fantastic program. That's, that's number one. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, Mo, this has been awesome, man. I wish we could spend a lot more time. And we're at the end of our time here today. I hope you come back sometime in the future. But uh, you've got a lot of people, I'm sure, that have been really intrigued by all the stuff you've been talking about, about leadership and creating a winning culture and a winning team. Uh, any last thoughts you want to leave the, uh, the audience with? Uh, well, there's like, I think there's seven points that we really need to, as leaders, we need to think about. Uh, the first one would be uh, leadership is a service position. We have to understand that, that we need to provide service to those who are um, we're, we're working with, to those who are we've been entrusted with. So if we don't first have that mindset that we're in this to, for service um, and that's not trying to get something from somebody, I think you're going to you're going to struggle um, leading anybody. So that's, my, that's the first thing. So we want to add value to those those people who are uh, who are in our care to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, like I think as also as a leader, you need to have continue your education. I mean, you need to grow you know, in your knowledge base of any discipline that you're in. Uh, you need to understand what you're working with. And again, this is always going back. I want to add value to those people who are with me. So if I'm if I'm working with anyone, basketball or anything else, I want to make sure I know what what is the industry telling me I need to be working on. What is what am, am I up to date with the new technologies? Uh, a business side of that would be a SWOT. So I'm doing a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, all that stuff. So what am I? What are some of the strengths in the industry that, for my company? Uh, are there any weaknesses internally that I'm I'm dealing with? Well, there's there's a conflict between uh, teammates. Uh, there's conflict between uh, a group of people in our group. Uh, are there are there new technologies that came out that I'm not aware of? Uh, so there's things that as as a leader. You need to be ahead of the curve a lot of the times. You need to plan and forecast for those things. Mm -hmm. um, third thing would be decision making. You got to have some level of standards when you're making decisions, because uh, if you're if you don't have those standards, you're going to be pulled in every which way in every direction, 
um, and people are going to find it hard to follow you because they're saying, okay, well, what are we really, what are we really trying to do here? And again, that goes back to my philosophy. When I come to basketball, I have the three points. I say program, team, and then whatever you need individually is the, is the thing that we work on last. Because again, if you're focused on the first two, it's easier to channel and find, okay, now how do I fit this person into what we're doing for the top two? It's a little easier for me that way. Mm. Um, and then proper time management. One of my biggest, one of the best books I've ever read was uh, Stephen Covey. Uh, and that was with... Uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Great book. And there are four quad, the, the four quadrants of time management. And that was that was an eye-opening experience for me because I wasn't doing those things. I wasn't saying, is this uh, you know urgent and important right now? Do I need to do, address it right now? I was getting distracted by emails and things of that nature. And as leaders, sometimes it happens. Somebody comes knocks on your door. Hey, it's, you know, the sky's falling, chicken little kind of effect. And you, you get caught into that. And we have to really try to manage our time uh, on a weekly and a daily basis to make sure we're focusing on things that are most important. Um, the next one would be, be enthusiastic. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of times your energy dictates how people respond. to you. So uh, granted, we're not there to be rah-rah guys all the time, um, but you want to at least show that you're engaged, that you're, you're aware of what's going on in your group, you're aware of what's going on within your team. Um, and you have, you have a sort of uh, empathy for those people who are struggling with certain things. You're not just out there doing my way and or this is the highway kind of thing. What you do is you say, hey, look, where are you at right now? And again, that whole meeting the person where they're at, trying to get them to get them up to speed to make sure that they're, you know, number one, comfortable. And number two, that they're going to be successful. Because ultimately, I think as a leader, that's your that's your job to make sure that you're, you're doing your best to make sure everybody's uh, successful in what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then take care of your health. I mean, a lot of times. We get so busy and we're running around, we're doing all the things, then we forget to eat, we forget to take care of ourselves properly, exercise, things of that nature. So, I mean, if you don't have the strength to do the things that you need to do, to, and again, to service, to service those who are in your care, uh, it's very difficult, it's very, very difficult to manage this because it, sometimes you're gonna need, you're gonna need a lot of energy to deal with a lot of different things that are going on. Mm -hmm. um, so I say, take care of your health and take care of what you're doing um, and how you're eating and what you're focused on. And then lastly, I would have to say, have an unshakable confidence. Because I think a lot of times your confidence can be shaken when you have, like, you know, you have a challenge, you may fail at something, something go the way you were looking at it. And then you say, well, am I really doing this the right way? And sometimes you want to scrap the whole thing. Sometimes you may have to. But in most cases, I think it's just, you know, it's a, it's a roadblock and you, you're going to have to get around it or get over it or get through it. Um, but again, it doesn't necessarily need to scrap the whole plan. You need to be focused and say, this is the vision. This is where I see uh, myself going. This is where I see the team going, and we're going to stick. We're going to stick to it. And once you start finding those little successes and getting that momentum going, once the momentum going, it's pretty easy. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. For instance, this pandemic, like you know, it could have shut. It could have, it could have destroyed what I was trying to build, rebuild. So, uh, but again, you have to have that vision, and you have to say, okay, what do I need to do to pivot to keep moving forward? Mm -hmm. And those would be my, those would be my seven, my seven areas of where I think you really need to focus on. That would work for me. I love it, man. They, those are fantastic points that you bring up and a great way to close out this episode because, you know, I think what this comes down to, everything you said there has to do with leading yourself. I think people oftentimes forget when they're in any kind of position to influence other people, it starts with leading yourself. And if you can effectively lead yourself, it is so much more impactful. Your leadership is so much more powerful. You have that much more reach and impact of the people around you. Uh, and that's ultimately what this comes down to, whether you're talking about decision-making, time management, enthusiasm, confidence, uh, all of those have to ultimately do with how you lead yourself. So great, great words of wisdom to leave the group with. Well, I appreciate the time, John. I mean, this has been wonderful. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to your success. I'm looking forward to when you bring the big dogs on and get Oprah and all those other guys on there. I'm looking <laughs> yeah, forward to yeah. it. So this, awesome. this is a wonderful, great platform. Well, you're all part of me getting there. I appreciate you uh, coming on and sharing your wisdom because I've had the utmost and always have had the utmost respect for you, seeing you in action and the things that you've done with Nick and the other guys on the team and the other people in your span of uh, your sphere of influence. Uh, very impressive. And I appreciate you and what you're doing. I appreciate you guys too, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying this lightly. I love all you guys. You guys are you guys are family, and I'm glad you guys are all doing well. That's that's great to hear. Oh, thanks, my man. 
Excellent. Well, we've been here another great episode today with Mo Taylor, who is one of the most impactful leaders uh, that I know and just done a ter- tremendous job in uh, in many areas of life, certainly in uh, the basketball and life arena. So uh, thanks again for tuning in today. Hope you found this uh, beneficial and valuable. Uh, I appreciate your comments. I appreciate you sharing. I appreciate all the things that you're doing to be uh, a steady and consistent participant of our show here and our episodes. If you have any ideas and thoughts of future episodes, please don't hesitate to let me know and go down below and give five-star review. Of course, your comments are appreciated. And again, thanks for your time today. And Mo, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. 